This video is for students taking separate science only. If you are studying combined science, then this video is not relevant for you. This video is on levers and gears. We are first going to recall how a force can cause an object to rotate. We will then explain how a lever system can transmit the rotational effect of forces. And finally, explain how a gear system can transmit the rotational effect of forces. There are some multiple choice questions and also some calculations questions for you to work on and therefore you need to make sure you have got pen, paper and a scientific calculator. If you've not got those things in front of you, please pause this video and go and get those now. Let's start with recalling how a force can cause an object to rotate. We can cause an object to rotate providing the force is applied not along the same line of action as the centre of mass. We need to apply the force at a distance from the pivot, and the pivot is a point about which an object can rotate. For example, a seesaw. There are two downwards forces acting on this seesaw, from the person on the left and from the person on the right. Because the object has a pivot, a point about which to rotate, that's the yellow part of the seesaw, the effect of these two forces is to each cause a rotation. The turning effect of a force is called a moment. So in this example, there'll be a moment due to the person on the left, and this moment will act in the anti-clockwise direction, and there'll be a moment due to the person on the right, and this moment will be in the clockwise direction. Other examples of when a force is applied at a distance from a pivot causing a moment or a rotational effect of a force could be a spanner being used to rotate a nut, the force applied is at the handle and the object rotates about the nut acting as the pivot. A diver at the end of a diving board, the weight of the diver is the force applied and the board rotates about the pivot, which is at position B. And a crane, the hanging weight off the crane is the applied force and the turning effect is about the pivot, which is at the T section of this crane. Can you now pause the video and answer the multiple choice questions one, two, and three? You should now have either A, B, or C written down for multiple choice questions one, two, and three. So self-assessing our answers, question number one, in order to cause an object to rotate, the force must be applied at a distance from the pivot. We know that B is wrong because if it acts along the same line of action, then it won't rotate. And C, anywhere along the object, doesn't exclude along the same line of action as the pivot. Question two, the pivot is the point about which the object can rotate. And finally, question three, the turning effect of a force is called a moment. Really important, we never get moment and momentum mixed up in physics. In order to calculate a moment, if you use the force and you multiply it by the perpendicular distance. Force is measured in newtons, distance is measured in meters, and so the units for moment are newton meters. Let's now have a look at an example. I'm going to model an example and then you will have an opportunity to practice. So example number one, we are going to determine the moment about the pivot and this is the situation. We can see the nut has been labelled as the pivot. The distance between the pivot and the applied force is 0 0.10 metres and the force is 50 newtons. We always start by writing out the equation in words, so moment equals force times perpendicular distance. We then substitute in the numbers, so we would write 50, which is a force, times by 0 0.10, which is a perpendicular distance. And then we calculate the answer and make sure we have our answer with units. Again, for a moment, the units are Newton meters. If you're calculating the moment, it's also important to state whether it is in the clockwise or the anti-clockwise direction. In this case, the rotation is clockwise. So example number two, we have got a situation as a pivot at the center and we've got three different forces acting at a distance from this pivot. And to start with, we are going to determine the moment of force A. So we can see that force A is on the left hand side. It is a force of 20 newtons and the distance between the pivot and the force is two meters. 
With this information, can you now please pause the video and complete your calculation? And self-assessing your work, you should have three lines of working. Moment equals force times perpendicular distance. The next line should be 20 times by 2. And then you should get 40 Newton metres, making sure on our answer we have units. And in this case, the direction is anti-clockwise. Can you now please pause the video and determine the moment of force B and force C? And self-assessing your answers. For both, you can see we have got units for our final answer and also stated whether it is clockwise or anti-clockwise. We should always have at least three lines of working for a calculations question. We have now recapped how a force can cause an object to rotate. So we are now going to look at lever systems and see how they can transmit the rotational effect of forces. We know that the moment is the turning effect of a force and levers are an example of how we can apply moments to do something useful. A lever is a simple machine and it consists of three parts, an effort, a load and a pivot. The pivot is the point about which the object can turn. The effort is the force used to move a load over a distance. That's the force that we put in. And the load is the overall force that is exerted on the surface. The load is often what wants to be moved or what wants to be lifted. So a simple lever could be like what we can see on the diagram here. It could be a solid beam laid across a pivot. And as the effort is applied to rotate one end around the pivot, the opposite end will also rotate and it'll rotate in the same direction. We can see here, if we apply a force at the effort, it will cause a clockwise rotation. And if that beam moves in the clockwise direction, the load will also move up in the clockwise direction. So the effect of applying our force, our effort, is that we will rotate or lift the load. Now, crucially, this makes our calculations much easier for us. The moment due to the effort around the pivot is equal to the moment of the load about the pivot. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. The moment due to the effort about the pivot is equal to the moment of the load about the pivot. Now, if we look at labeling some things, so we can see that the distance between the pivot and the effort has been loaded, that's our perpendicular distance, and then we've got our force of the effort, if we want to be able to lift a load, then we can see that the larger the distance between the pivot and the effort, the larger the moment. And if we've got a large moment due to the effort, we know that we'll therefore have a large moment for that load. And that is why they say that levers can be used as force multipliers. They allow a large force to act upon the load, even though we only put in a small effort. The larger the distance between the pivot and the effort, the smaller the force of effort we can apply to create the same moment. This is why it is often easier to turn a nut with a long spanner than a short spanner, because the longer spanner will have a longer distance between the pivot and where the effort is applied, creating a larger moment. Can you now pause this video and answer multiple choice questions four, five, and six? You should now have either A, B, or C written down for questions four, five, and six. So let's now go through these. Number four, the lever is described as a force multiplier because the effort is smaller than the load. Remember the effort is the force that we put in and that is small. The load is what we want to lift and that can be heavier. Number five, the moment due to the effort is equal to the moment of the lifting load. It's really important, we're gonna be using that in our calculations. And number six, if the load is very heavy, in order to lift the load, we can increase the distance from the pivot to the load. This is very important because if the effort is far from the pivot, we've got a large moment due to the effort and therefore we can lift a heavier load. If we 
the reason that A is wrong is that if we increase the distance from the pivot to the load, then we are going to need uh, a much larger force to lift that load because we're creating a large moment. So let's now have a look at an example together. So we've got a solid beam, it's 0.5 meters long, and it is laid across a pivot to form a simple lever as shown in the diagram. The effort and the load are each are at each end of the beam, and the pivot is 0.1 meters from the end of the beam. Calculate the heaviest load that could be lifted using a force of effort of 500 newtons applied 0.4 meters from the pivot. So let's just identify what all these different numbers are. So we've been told that the effort is 0.4 meters from the pivot, so I've labeled that distance on our diagram, and we know that the effort is 500 newtons. We've also been told that the load, um, that the pivot is 0.1 meters from the end of the beam, but also that the load is at the end of the beam. So we can conclude that the distance between the load and the pivot is 0.1 meters. We want to find out the force of the load. So the first thing we have to do is calculate the moment due to the effort. And in this case, that is due to the 500 Newton force. We need three lines of working for that. So moment equals force times perpendicular distance, which is 500 times by 0.4, and we get 200 Newton meters. We then use the fact that the moment due to the effort is equal to the moment of the load. Therefore, the moment of the load must be what we calculated in step one, which is 200 Newton meters. Finally, we are now in a position to calculate the force of the load. We know that the force is the moment divided by the perpendicular distance. I've just rearranged the equation moment equals force times perpendicular distance. The moment is 200 Newton meters and the perpendicular distance is 0.1. And so we see that we can lift a load of 2000 Newtons. Just taking our units here, that final answer is a force and therefore the units should be Newtons. So let's have a look at an example together. So don't pause the video quite yet because I'm going to give you a few tips to help you along the way. So the drummer's toe pushes with a 1.5 Newton force on the foot pedal. The perpendicular distance from the pivot to the force is 0.12 meters. So we can see the pivot is right on the right hand side of that diagram. The perpendicular distance from the pivot to the chain is 0.2 meters. And we need to calculate the force of the chain acting on the foot pedal. So using those same steps as before, I have put in some words in blue to help you. And you are going to pause this video and you are going to fill in the gaps. So self-assessing our answers. Firstly, we had to calculate the moment due to the effort. That was 1.5 times 0.12, and we got 0.18 Newton meters. Make sure we've got units in our answer, please. Step two, we should have found that the moment of the load was equal to what we calculated in step one. And then finally, for step three, we had to be the moment divided by the perpendicular distance. In this case, the moment we calculated in step one and two the perpendicular distance we are told is 0 0.20 meters. And so the final answer is 0 0.9 newtons. Can you now pause the video and have a go at this one by yourself? Good, you should now have your answers to step one, two and three. Can you now self assess your answers, checking all your units and your line of work? So we have looked at um, how forces can cause an object to rotate, and we have also looked at lever systems and how they can be used as force multipliers and transmit the rotational effect of forces. We are now going to explain how a gear system can also be used to transmit the rotational effect of forces. A gear is essentially a circle with teeth cut out, and gears can be used to do two things, change the speed, and change the direction. Gears change the speed and direction by being put next to each other. 
Let's have a look at this example here. You can see that the left hand gear is turning in the clockwise direction. And as a result, the right hand gear is being turned in the anti-clockwise direction. So we can see that we have changed the direction. We have changed from going clockwise to anti-clockwise. But if we look at the speed, the speed of both of these is the same. If you identify one of those teeth and time how long it takes to make one complete loop, it takes the same amount of time for both of these gears. So in this example, we have managed to change the direction, but we have not changed the speed. So how can we change the speed? Well, we can change the speed if the number of teeth on one of the gears is different to the other. In this example, the left hand gear has fewer teeth and the right hand gear has more teeth. This means the left hand gear is actually moving faster than the right hand gear. If we time how long it takes for a tooth on the left hand gear to make it all the way round, it gets round a lot quicker than the right hand. We cause the gear that is causing the motion, the driver gear. And the gear that is moving as a result is called the driven gear. Using similar language to our levers, you can think of the driver gear as putting in the effort and the driven gear as being the load. Can you now pause this video and answer questions seven, eight and nine? Good. So you should now have answers A, B and C in front of you for questions seven, eight and nine. Number seven, gears can be used to change the speed and the direction. Number eight, two gears side by side that are the same size will rotate in opposite directions, but they will be at the same speed. And number nine, two gears side by side that are different sizes will rotate in opposite directions and at different speeds. So I said that gears can be used to change both the speed and the direction, but what happens if you want to change the speed, but not the direction? In order to do that, we just have to use more gears. In this example, if we rotate the yellow gear anti-clockwise, we know that the red gear will rotate clockwise. If the red gear rotates clockwise, then the blue gear will rotate anti-clockwise. So in this example, the yellow and the blue gear will rotate in the same direction, but because they've got a different number of teeth, they will still have a different speed. So we can see that in motion here. The driver gear on the left is our red gear, it's rotating clockwise, causing our blue gear to rotate anti-clockwise and therefore our green gear is rotating clockwise again. Again, the red gear is moving at a faster speed than the green gear, so this system keeps the same direction but slows down the speed. So, pausing the video, can you answer multiple choice questions 9 and 10? You should now have A, B or C written down for questions 9 and questions 10. The yellow gear is moving fastest because it's got the smallest number of teeth. And the yellow and the blue are rotating in the same direction. So just a reminder before we go into some examples that the driver gear is equivalent to our effort and the force of that driving gear is transmitted to the driven gear, which is our load. Now, our rules for gears are slightly different to our rules for levers. So let's have a look at that. For a gear, the moment of the driver gear and the driven gear are not the same. However, the force of the driver gear and the force of the driven gear are the same. So this is slightly different to our levers. In our levers, we had different forces, but the same moment for our gears we have the same forces, but a different moment. So how do we work out the moment of a gear? Well, we use the same equation that we know for moments, which is force times perpendicular distance. 
but the perpendicular distance here is simply the radius of the gear. So for our driver gear, the moment is the force times the radius of the driver gear. And for our driven gear, the moment of the driven gear is the force times the radius of the driven gear. Pausing the video and answering questions 11 and 12. You should now have A, B or C written down for 11 and 12. So for our driven gear and our driver gear, the force is the quantity that is the same for both. And the quantity that is used as the perpendicular distance is the radius. Let's now have a look at a model example. A gear with radius 0.1 meters is turned by a gear with radius of 0.05 meters. The moment of the smaller gear is 20 newton meters. Calculate the moment of the larger gear. So firstly, we need to calculate the force due to the driver. Now, before we do this, it's good to allocate the quantities mentioned in the questions and make sure we know what is associated with the driver and what is associated with the driven gear. So we are told that a gear with radius 0.1 is turned. That means it's the driven gear. So the driven gear is 0.1 meters by a gear with radius of 0.05. So our driver gear is 0.05 meters. The moment of the smaller gear is 20 newton meters. That means our driver gear has a moment of 20 newton meters. So if we want to calculate the force of the driver, we would do the force is the moment divided by the perpendicular distance. We know that for a gear, the perpendicular distance is the radius. We therefore do 20 divided by 0.05 and we end up with 400 newtons, making sure we've got units for our answer. Step two, we use the fact that for gears, the force of the driver gear is equal to the force of the driven gear, and therefore the force of the driven gear is 400 newtons. And finally, we can calculate the moment of the driven gear using the fact that we know that moment equals force times perpendicular distance. Again, with gears, that perpendicular distance is the radius. So we do 400, which is the force we calculated in step two, times by 0.1, because that is the radius of the driven gear, and we get 40 newton meters, making sure our units of moments are in newton meters. I would like you now to pause this video. I have put in some blue text to help you. Let's have a go at answering this question. And self-assessing our work. The moment due to the driver was 40 divided by 0.05, and so you should have 800 newtons. If you've not got newtons on your answer, please add them in now. Step two, the force of the driven gear is therefore equal to the force we calculated in step one, which is 800 newtons. And finally, the moment of the driven gear is the force times by its radius. So you should have a line of working that says 800 times by 0.25. And then the units for that answer are newton meters. And can you now pause this video and have a go at this one by yourself? And self-assessing your answers.